Indians to not only the estuarians, but the entire country. In fact, the whole wide world. But things are changing, uh, and fast, uh, and if something isn't done really quick, uh, we may lose it all, uh, quicker than I thought. No, uh, 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 spot, no, quick, no, wait, no, oh, no, no. is the newest major city of all of North America. And the reason I say that, 5,000 years ago, that's not very long. Remember, the pyramids were about to come 5,000 years ago is the Gulf of Mexico. There was no land here. Uh, down at the mouth of the river, which is only 600 years old. You think about that. You must probably have buildings over in Europe that are old and then the newest land in Louisiana. It's called South Pass. It's a unique river system on the North American continent. There's no other river system that has built the amount of land and ecosystem as the Mississippi River. South Louisiana, it's been said, is not so much a place as it is a process. Uh, there have been some massive, massive changes in climate and weather through history. You've had ice ages when continuous winter happened all the way down into where the United States is now. Thousands of years ago, the glaciers started to melt. And when they did, the water had to go somewhere and they formed a river, which we call the Mississippi River. The topsoil of all of these states and parts of Canada emptied into the bowels of the Mississippi River. The river starts to fill in its valley, and then it gets to the coast. Then it starts building land out into the Gulf of Mexico. Deltas began to form in coastal Louisiana. The bottom topography of the sea was right, the amount of sediment coming down, a lot of things fell into place so that a delta could begin to form. The Mississippi River has shifted a number of times during geologic time, and river systems like the Mississippi, they'll come down one channel, and then every year they flood, they make the natural levee, and then after a while they shift because they're trying to find the fastest route to the sea. Maybe 1,500 years ago, the Mississippi River traveled through what is now the city of New Orleans. When it moved to where it is today, it left the Metairie Ridge and the Gentilly Ridge. 60 to 70 percent of the city is uh, below sea level. The areas along the river uh, are pretty much above sea level. In South Louisiana, the high ground is next to the river. Unlike any place else in the country where you go down to the river, in Louisiana, we have to first go up and then down the river. The most stable parts of the city tend to be the older parts of the city, because that's where the high ground was. In New Orleans, the natural levees probably were 10 feet high, right next to the river, and then they progressively slope away. From the high ground, which is basically the French Quarter, uh, in just a matter of tens of blocks, the land tapered off such that there was a marsh between the French Quarter and the lake. In the old days, the Indians used to come down the Mississippi River and cross bayous, or either they would portage their canoe over the dry land between Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. You could take a canoe down Bayou St. John, and then you could take this portage and get into the Mississippi River system. It's less than a mile to actually have to, you know, carry the canoes. 
When the French were here, they were talking with the Native Americans and they wanted to settle where there was a natural trade route. Bayou St. John goes into Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Pontchartrain goes into the Gulf of Mexico. It's much easier for a sailing ship to come through the Lake Pontchartrain system, sailing and you know tacking back and forth across the lake, than trying to come up the Mississippi River. Two thirds of North America emptied into the Mississippi River. So when it comes down, we have what we call New Orleans, the economic valve. There was method in the madness. I don't know if they ever expected it to remain here uh, all that long, but there was certainly a uh, method behind placing New Orleans at this particular location. When New Orleans was settled in 1718, there were no levees, no levees at all. Of course, the city was much smaller and much more primitive and everything, but it was also more susceptible to any weather problems. They had river flooding and they had water that could come from the lake south of them or anywhere. In the early days, the river was a real serious problem. And like, say, the very first year that New Orleans was here, we flooded 100%. And for the next three or four years, we flooded until they said, we got to do something. So they decided they would start building levees. They got it up to about eight or nine feet high and one flood washed it out completely. So then they said, no, we got to really do something to, to keep it out of the city of New Orleans. And that's when they really put a full effort into it. And the first levees of any substance in North America were built right here in New Orleans. It's a, a pretty simple technology. Uh, it just consists of bringing the city with higher and higher levees as the water increases. If you look at a geologic, a topo map of the city, New Orleans is a bulb. We levied all the way around to try to keep that, that water out. If it ever gets over the levees, it's gonna be hard to get out because the levees then are working against you. you see. The greatest disaster in the history of the United States was the 1927 flood. Uh, there were literally 20 million people in North America and the United States were displaced by the water. The federal government finally said, we can't have this happen again. It's hurting the economy as well as the people. Congress mandated the Corps of Engineers to come in here and build a levee system that would allow the development of coastal Louisiana in a way that had never been seen before. A very dynamic river created all these wetlands as it switched its delta around the southern part of Louisiana. And now we've tried to fix it in one place, basically, in order to live here. We moved to this spot on the Mississippi, and then we decided we needed to maintain navigation in a very dynamic river, so we've maintained channels. The river brought down flooding. We built up levees. The levees cut off flow to the marshes. It's the epitome of battle of man over nature. The original drainage attempts came about as a need to move water, not vast amounts of water, because those days New Orleans was the French Quarter and the swamps. Through the 19th century, the city's drainage system remained primarily canals and street gutters. These were often choked with mud and garbage and whatever else would pile up in the streets. Before the Civil War, a series of pumps were constructed along the Metairie Ridge. These were really very, very rudimentary. They used a paddle wheel device, pretty much the same as you find on the paddle wheel boat. New Orleans was filled with stagnant water. It was very hard to get it out. And by the 1870s and 1880s, the city had really reached the point where it could not expand very much beyond its urban limits. We have our problems with the natural enemies like mosquitoes, and if you couldn't dry out the land, if that swamp would have prevailed, then no telling what kind of diseases you'd have. Soon after the 1878 yellow fever epidemic, there was a growing knowledge about sanitation in cities, and it was felt that New Orleans, because of its very, very poor drainage system, was uh, one of the sickest cities in the United States, and it was. It had a very high death rate. And they figured the best thing you can do from a public health standpoint is to drain it. The father of the New Orleans drainage system is Albert Baldwin Wood. In 1897, he designed and built the biggest drainage pumps anywhere in the world, 14 feet in diameter. They were revolutionary. There was nothing like them on Earth. Except for minor modifications, they're still the same original pumps that are pumping today that pumped in the early 1900s. When it rains, the water flows onto the street 
from the street into catch basins, large pipelines, then bring it to covered canals or open canals. We have many open canals in the city. And from the canal, it comes to the suction basin or the wet well of the pumping station. Water is propelled from the pump, discharged into either another canal, which then goes to another drainage station, or ultimately to the lake. There's been an ongoing drainage pumping construction program to keep pace with the needs of the city. The pumping stations are still currently being improved upon. Pump drainage is a way of life for us. People get excited about whether there's earth warming and they tend to judge changes in weather by what's happening at the moment or happened last year. But in truth, you're talking about swings in climate temperature, tremendous swings. Anytime you have a glacial period, the sea level is going to drop. But right now they're melting, so the sea level's coming up. A very subtle change in temperature or in sea level can cause astronomical consequences. The big concern is maybe the use of fossilized fuels is making this happen faster than it normally does. Global warming is, is very dangerous for Louisiana. If you get increases in water level, six inches, 12 inches, it completely alters the ecosystem that the plants are in. You're gonna have much more salt water in and it'll start killing off the brackish and the freshwater marsh. So it's going to be devastating to the, the whole coast of Louisiana. There's no high land between us and the Gulf. You could wind up with New Orleans being almost an island if it was there at all. The amount of sea level rise that is projected associated with global warming is relatively small compared to a fairly large amount of subsidence that we already have. The main reason the city is sinking is because of the levees. I mean, it's, it's a real double-edged sword. We don't flood when the river rises anymore. But on the flip side, when the river did overflow the banks, it deposited silt. Oh, hey, everybody. We're sure going to have fun today because we're looking for my good friend, Murky the Mudcat. Oh, say, Mr. Bill, you've got a bite. I'll reel him in. Oh, hey, Murky, how you doing there? <laughs> Oh, Murky's doing great. It's just that these levees that were built to prevent flooding have prevented the mud from naturally rebuilding the land. Now the muddy Mississippi just keeps flowing and dumps the mud into the deep water of the Gulf. Well, Murky can't hold his breath any longer and has to go. Oh, see you later, Murky! Okay, now I'll cast off and maybe we'll get a big catch. Okay, Mr. Ian. We've been cut off from the Mississippi River flooding-wise 150 years, so you know the, the soils just keep compacting and compacting and going down. And that's the same thing that's happening in coastal wetland marshes where they don't have the, the sediment coming back in. They're compacting down so they get to be a point where the type of vegetation cannot live because it, the, the soil is too far down, so it becomes open water. I think the major threat to us is the threat by hurricane. The Gulf Coast region is unique in the world in the number of really catastrophic tropical storms that hit the region. Every year we get the scenario that a hurricane or some particular storm event could come here at the whim of Mother Nature. Uh, gee kids, I'm not sure we can do our show today because it looks like Hurricane Sluggo is headed right for us here in America's wetlands. That's right, Mr. Bill. And since New Orleans is below sea level, if a hurricane hit us directly, it could push the water over the levees and fill it to the top. Oh well, no, then we'd better leave. Well, it's too late to evacuate since all the roads are jammed and underwater. Then where can we go that's safe? Here, this should work. Gee, I hope it doesn't get much higher. Well, Reed the alligator doesn't seem too worried. Yeah, yeah, that's because he can swim. You know, I don't do that too well. Well, in that case, Reed says he'll have one of his buddies come and give you a lift. Uh, that's okay. There's just so much you can do to protect an engineered place and that's why I think New Orleanians are so afraid of hurricanes because a direct hit would take this city out. I mean, the estimates are that a direct hit on New Orleans would put us underwater at some level or other for six months at least. 
The hurricane threat to New Orleans comes from Lake Pontchartrain overtopping the levee, but put 10, 20 feet of water, possibly 30 feet of water in the city. Once the water comes over the levee, and if the wind continues long enough, New Orleans will fill up to the top of the levee. New Orleans is probably more vulnerable than any other urban center, certainly in the United States, and probably more vulnerable than any other city in the world. The city's at risk, 100,000 dead. City government be inoperable for three to six months. The city has already negotiated with governments on the North Shore to relocate city government until the city's repaired. The Red Cross announced we're not opening any hurricane evacuation shelters in South Louisiana. Those are places you should not evacuate to. Those are places you should evacuate from. People are going to have to cooperate and, and do an early evacuation and just decide that that's one of the costs of living in New Orleans. Just take a little trip and go somewhere else. If you wait too late, it's too late. They ought to take it upon themselves to have evacuation plans. If a storm is headed toward New Orleans, that they have a plan on getting themselves and their family out of the city. Any place you go, you're going to put yourself in some sort of danger because you don't know what sort of rising water you're going to have surrounding you. Interstate 10 going in either direction out of the city, getting up to Interstate 59 and any of the other interstates leading out of the city, you're going to go over an awful lot of water to get there and you know you're supposed to evacuate, what is it, 48, 72 hours ahead of a storm hitting. Most people have to work. They can't go in and tell their boss, I'm evacuating. And how much wetland has been lost since Hurricane Betsy hit? So how much has hurricane protection been reduced? And most people don't realize that the wetlands that have been lost were the buffer against hurricanes. And so if you cut that in half, then your protection against hurricanes is half what it was when there was a Hurricane Betsy. With this whole change of the ecosystem down here, we're getting less uh, vegetation for the birds to live in, less marsh land for different types of species to nest and breed. So we're seeing a real impact there. Because of all of that nutrient here, over thousands and thousands of years, you've had this Mississippi River flyway develop where birds that are living down in Central America will come through this area into North America and then spread out to go up and nest and lay their eggs. And then at the end of the year, after they've hatched all their babies and fledged them, then they all fly back through this area heading south. Well, Mr. Bill, Captain Eddie's a little protective of his future family. Oh, don't worry, Eddie. I mean no harm. I just wanted to show the kids where you live. But this forest looks like it's all dying and everything. That's right, Mr. Bill, because of the saltwater intrusion. You see, as more salt water from the Gulf comes further inland, some plants can't survive, including these trees. Oh, that's too bad. Come on now. He's going to be mean to me. Nah, it's Lumberjack Sluggo. And he says this dead tree needs to be cut down before it falls and hurts somebody. No, don't do that. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Poor Eddie and his kids, no. Timber. No, no, no. The Mississippi Flyway provides wintering habitat for between 50 and 70 percent of the ducks and geese that live in North America. Some of them stay here all winter, and some of them stop here a while and then go down the coast to Mexico or go across the Gulf. Petrochemical plants in Louisiana discharge more into the environment than other states in the U.S. If you have all these different petrochemicals in the Mississippi River and these start diverting out into the Martian wetlands, what kind of impact is it going to have on the ecosystem out there? And we don't know. Oh, uh, hey everybody! We're diving in the deep waters of the Gulf off of America's wetland to look for one of my best pals, Delta the Dolphin. Hey! Uh, sure doesn't look like there's much living down here, though, except some goldfish. That's right, Mr. Bill. There used to be lots of life down here, but because of all the runoff and toxins coming down the river, it's created what they call the Dead Zone. The Dead Zone? Oh, no, get me out of here! Well, maybe Delta the Dolphin here can show us a nicer place. 
Oh, well, sure, Delta. Lead the way. Hey, she's pretty cute. Oh, for a dolphin, that is. Oh, hey, Mr. Bill. Look, a sunken ship. Oh, boy. Maybe we'll find Jean Lafitte's sunken treasure. Hey. Gee, I guess something else is alive down here. And he looks mighty hungry. Oh, no, hey, help, Delta. Save me. Sorry, Mr. Bill, but dolphins are very intelligent. She's not sticking around. Hey, no, wait, no, no, don't do that. Wait, no, get me out of here. No, wait, no, wait. Oh, the brown pelican and the state bird all died because we used DDT as a pesticide. And as that came down the river, it would get into the fish, and then the pelicans ate the fish. And then when they laid eggs, the eggs would just have a thin shell. Then when the mother tried to sit on them to keep them warm, she'd break them. And so all the pelicans in Louisiana died from the pesticides that came down the river. Eventually, this country banned DDT. But it took a while for it to get out of the ecosystem. And then we brought in pelicans from Florida. It took a couple of tries, but now they're all over the state. It's wonderful to see them again. The coastal wetlands in Louisiana provide 40% of the nation's fisheries. The Louisiana wetlands are so productive that it's comparable to the production of the Atlantic seaboard. Oh boy, brother! So how come all you guys like to hang around here? Well, you see, Mr. Bill, the wetlands and marshes are the nursery for Salty and his friends. In fact, almost all the critters in the Gulf spend part of their time in America's wetland. If the rest of the country realize how important it is, they may invest more in trying to protect it. So then we should tell our friends about the problem and learn more about what we can do to help, right? Now. That's right, Mr. Bill. So let's go and... Oh, no, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. No, I'm in here. No. Oh, oh, no. 17% of the oil and 25% of the gas this nation uses and produces goes through Louisiana waters. The construction of oil and gas canals allowed salt water to come in, and many of the marshes in Louisiana are brackish water marshes and cannot tolerate certain salt levels. In coastal Louisiana, we like to see a good balance of freshwater marsh followed by intermediate marsh brackish marsh and salt marsh and that's what you need to maintain the balance of the ecosystem so that all the critters out there and all the plants can interact in a healthy way. It's not so much that nutria or muskrats or oil field canals or levees on the Mississippi River, any one of those individually is really the problem. All have created a situation right now that has South Louisiana in a state of collapse and so goes South Louisiana, so goes New Orleans. We finally come to the realization you can't muscle this system around. Mark Twain wouldn't have been surprised to know that if you read Life on the Mississippi. You know, the irony is that most of the things that we now recognize as the biggest contributors to the problem were at the time sold as the keys to prosperity. Every year there's a big drive around the city to collect Christmas trees. You know, we actually started the Christmas tree program, educated a lot of people that there is a marsh out there, and it's helped keep a lot of trees out of landfills for a while. But anybody who thinks you're going to save this place with Christmas trees or similar Band-Aid projects is kidding themselves. We really have to use the river. It's the biggest river in the United States. It's the biggest river in North America. It's the biggest resource we have. We're going to make strategically placed, very controllable gaps in the levees and let the water out into the marshes, guide it out to where we need it, and let it really restore the health and vigor back to those marshes. Some people are going to be hurt economically. Now, those people are going to fight the versions. So the way we're going to get over this is by simply going in and say, we're going to use state money to compensate you. Diversions, for the most part, are bringing fresh water into the wetlands but they actually do very little to bring sediment in, and it's the sediment that's really needed to counterbalance the natural subsidence that takes place on the delta. What we need are inexpensive ways to dredge material from the river or from the offshore and bring that material into the wetlands to build up the elevation of the wetlands. We just started farming marsh recently. These bays that were solid water back in the 1930s and now they're shallow, 
plant salt marsh on them. Those plants baffle the wave energy and whatever sediment is in the water falls out and the land comes back again. We're developing new plants that grow faster and stronger. We went into areas of high stress and picked plants and grew them in greenhouse and basically cloned them. We have field tested them. It's been hugely successful. We need to restore the barrier islands. We're talking about dredging sand from offshore to raise the elevation of the islands and extend the width of the islands. Louisiana can't do it alone. We need the help of the federal government. But it's so hard to get Congress to take action on something like this, and Louisiana doesn't have a lot of political power. All we have is the appeal to the national sense to save the coast. If everybody in the state legislature received four or five letters, that's all they'd be talking about. They would get so focused on coastal issues, but they're not getting that mandate from the electorate. Educating the public and officials on how to deal with these situations is one very important aspect. We're beginning a national awareness program because this is a national treasure. This is the largest wetland by far. There's a lot of money in Washington. It just depends on what their priorities are. What we've got to do is not go try to create new money. We've got to go try to create new priorities. When we talk about conserving coastal Louisiana, it's not that we're going to conserve coastal Louisiana the way it is today. We're going to conserve a way of life, the ambiance, the music, the food, the manner of the people, all of these great things that, that people seem to love about coastal Louisiana are, are things that can be conserved. We are survivors. People of New Orleans will be here thousands of years from now. Well, I was born and raised here. I grew up, um, the first house was on a magazine off in Nashville and lived in the uptown area. And fortunately, I didn't have an aptitude for anything. So, uh, you know, I went into comedy. And uh, people said, well, you're not even funny. I said, well, I know, but, you know, this, I always want to do this, you know. So I uh, somehow persevered, uh, packed my bags, moved to New York uh, when I was, didn't know any better. And uh, somehow got on Saturday Night Live from the first season, Mr. Bill was, I, I submitted a whole reel of films and they picked Mr. Bill out and ultimately got a job on the show as a staff writer and making other movies. But I kept coming back over the years visiting New Orleans because I, I, mean, I never realized what a unique place it was until I actually left, you know. You, you go to New York or other places and ask for a go cup and you get wrestled down by security. I mean, it's, this is a unique city. I guess the most interesting thing was how new the area was. I, you know, I assumed, you know, like Pontchartrain and everything was prehistoric. And, but, uh, you know, the, the fact that the mouth of the river is, you know, there are buildings in Europe that are, uh, you know, older than the mouth of the river. That, that was amazing. Now, the Lake Pontchartrain wasn't here 3,000 years ago. It's just, just people all of a sudden showed up at the right time and then, oh, we'll build a city here because it was an interesting trade and you know, connecting point. And uh, I guess that's one of the most interesting things. And then it kind of evolved into man against nature. You know, it was, it was a great commerce site. And was, more people wanted to, to live here because of all the success. And then, then they decided we had to use technology to help make it more inhabitable to live in a place that really, really shouldn't support this many people. And it, it, I wanted to show how it, the current predicament naturally evolved. 